We are now going to transition with some help um, to our second panel. So I think we re need to reset the stage just a little bit. Uh, and uh, as the stage is being reset by these two gentlemen, thank you very much, um, I will do a brief introduction of our next panelists. Um, we are very fortunate to have with us Dr. Weiwei Wang as a visiting scholar with us here at the Institute. She is focusing on interpreting quality assessment during her research here as a visiting scholar. She's from the School of Interpreting and Translation Studies at Guangdong University, uh, sorry, Guangdong University of Foreign Studies, and she's currently the Deputy Secretary General of the National Interpreting Committee of the Translation Association of China. Dr. Wang has widely published in top journals and has led a number of major research projects. Go ahead and join us on stage, please. Uh, right next to me. We also have Dr. Wallace Chen, who is a professor and program head of the Chinese English Translation and Interpretation Program here at the Middlebury Institute. An alumni of the Institute, he has over 30 years of experience in providing translation and interpretation services to major corporations, government agencies, and international organizations across Asia and North America. He has been teaching Chinese English translation and interpretation since 1997. Wallace, please join us. Carlos Andrew has worked as a literary translator for about 25 years, during which time he has translated some 200 titles from English and German into Spanish and Catalan for several top Spanish and US publishers. He teaches translation here at the Institute. Carlos, please join us. And Dr. Damien Fan Jiaming is currently associate professor at the Graduate Program in Translation and Interpretation at National Taiwan University. He's also one of the five vice presidents of AIC, of the executive committee of the International Association of Conference Interpreter, which goes by its French acronym, AIC. Damien taught as a visiting professor at MIS from 2019 to 2020, and we're really pleased to have him back calling in from Taiwan early morning. Okay. Thank you, Damien. Um, so I will start with a general question for all of you, and then I will go to asking specific questions of each panelist. So the general question I'd like to ask first, starting with uh, Dr. Wang, is all of you are here today are both educators and practitioners. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask you, how are you and your colleagues using AI, whether it be colleagues in teaching or colleagues as practitioners? How are you using AI right now in both of your areas of your work? All right, thank you very much. Um, so we are talking about two roles. The first is teachers or trainers. Well, for this role, uh, basically we did four things. Um, first one, Yes, okay, the first one is our curriculum enhancement. Um, in Guangwai, we actually integrated a lot of AI topics into our curriculums. Um, for instance, like um, CACI, um, Computer Assisted uh, simul uh, Consecutive Interpreting, uh, is actually not only a, a, a subject where we teach, but also a research area. And also we integrated programming, AI-related uh, algorithms, in our MTI and uh, BTI, which is bachelor programs. The second thing we did was we actually work with Alibaba to develop our own algorithm, which is called PASI, P-A-S-I. And we try to create um, ai assisted tools for our students to better learn their skills or um, practice with uh, real-time feedbacks. And third thing we did is actually we try to advocate uh, more on critical thinking and uh, we want our students to emphasize that um, AI is only a tool for you. You have to have very strong critical thinking in order to make your final decision based on what AI gives you. And the last thing we did is uh, TOT, um, trainers 
uh, training because we wanted to uh, also update uh, what our trainers um, is doing now uh, or uh, we wanted to update their knowledge scope to effectively use AI in our teaching and also we wanted to build more connection with the industry to know what's going on lately uh, in the AI industry. So that's what we did for things as uh, educators. I will be real quick. <laughs> and the second thing is about the uh, um, interpreting part. Um, for this role, actually, I myself uh, and my colleagues selectively use AI tools. So we don't uh, like use all the tools at the same time blindly. We try to find out that things that can assist us with preparation, um, like uh, perplexity. We use this to do our pre-task preparation. And the process, we use um, like ASR and SIMO notes to help us uh, increase our, enhance our um, efficiency. And for the quality control, we are very cautioned, uh, cautious about the use of AI and we also did uh, client education so that um, we can uh, inform our clients about what's going on in this language industry with AI tools and technology so that um, everybody can be in the same page about this uh, development. So all in all, we view AI as a valuable assets, a tool that enhance our productivity, but also we are maintaining um, our balance between like AI as a tool and um, AI as a threat. Thank you. Thank you. So I do want to just draw on a couple of themes that cut across from what you're saying and what I heard in the first panel, which is that we do have to make sure that we're equipping our students, our students are equipping themselves with critical thinking skills, strong target language skills first and foremost before diving into using all of these tools. And then for the interpreters, another theme that was recurring was this idea of client education, helping the clients to really understand what is or isn't the right use of AI in these processes. Okay, thank you. Wallace, same question for you, please. Um, as both an educationer and a practitioner, how are you and your colleagues using AI in both areas of your work? Yeah, uh, I think in uh, academic and professional settings, uh, we we can use AI tools in many, many areas. For example, we can do uh, terminology research uh, using tools such as uh, ChatGPT, uh, Notion, and WebCorp, and a sketch engine. We can also do text summarization. So whenever you uh, you have a new text that you need to translate or interpret, you can use Notion, for example, to provide you with a summarization before you even start reading it. And also, uh, nowadays, clients send you videos in advance. You can uh, run those videos uh, using transcription tools so that uh, you have a readily available transcription that you could, uh, you could test with your translation or practice uh, with your translation and to get prepared uh, whenever you are ready. And also, uh, another area would be keyword retrieval because uh, Whenever we, we are facing with uh, abundant texts, we need to retrieve uh, terminology as fast as possible and also keywords so that we can identify the kind of information that we would need to focus on uh, in advance. And uh, for training uh, in the area of simultaneous interpreting and site translation, we now have tools, for example, to do text segmentation or uh, chunking so that we could teach students and also we could help interpreters uh, better prepare with the kind of text that they would need to translate. And uh, there are also other areas that we could use uh, AI tools, for example, uh, text comparison, and you could uh, dive in into a uh, huge uh, corpora or huge translation corpora that you could find many, many translation examples. And uh, you could also retrieve background information in advance, and especially for uh, English into your B language, you could do uh, collocation checking and intuition confirmation. So that's all kind of areas that we could utilize AI, and I believe that uh, when you complete a TNI job, uh, there are many steps and texts involved, and so uh, 
AI definitely can play a crucial role in this area, and I believe uh, we could use it as a very smart assistant, in my opinion. Thank you. So it sounds like a lot of the emphasis that you're talking about within interpretation is in the preparatory stages as opposed to in the moment of the interpretation itself. Yeah, for uh, in the moment interpretation, there are now uh, kind of like a teleprompting uh, equipment where uh, they would identify terminology, uh, locations of names, and uh, numbers that you could rely on. So whenever they identify those uh, pre prearranged uh, key terms, they will pop up on the screen to help you interpret as quickly as possible so that you could save some capacity for dealing with other uh, key information in the translation process. Thank you. Carlos, please, for yourself, and as a, particularly as a literary translator and teacher of translation, um, both as a practitioner and educator, where are you seeing AI being used and being useful? So in the classroom, in the translation class, um, of course, we use machine translation and we post edit um, and we evaluate the, the machine translation output and then we work with machine translation integrated in CAD tools and we combine what, what sketch engine can give us in, in terms of terminology with, with ChatGPT and we create term bases and we, we do all that. Um, but one thing I think is super, super important is that students realize that most um, machine translation and AI tools are not necessarily um, geared towards translators. They are, they are, they are designed for, for to, to deliver an end product for the, for the final client. And so it's, it's, it, to me it's crucial that, that students see that machine translation makes mistakes, for instance, that humans don't make, right? Um, I heard once that Somebody said that with a sentence like, the kid threw a stone at the window and it broke, that when machines were able to identify this it as the rock, sorry, as the window and not the rock, that would mean that we wouldn't need translators anymore. And the truth is that right now, many um, machine translation engines and AIs will translate this sentence correctly, but this is a very elementary, uh, elementary level of, of implicit, like understanding implicit meaning that the machine has achieved. Um, I'll give you another example. If you give, if you give the sentence, um, he saw her duck to a machine, right? Without context, we cannot, we, cannot, we cannot know what this duck means. It can be a bird or it can be a verb for crouch. But with context, for us humans, it will be quite easy to understand what, the duck, what this duck means, right? If we say, he saw her duck, behind the bushes, we, will, we know that this is a verb. And if we say, we saw her duck, and then what beautiful plumage, we'll know it's talking about a bird. But most machines still don't, are not, are not capable of, of inferring this meaning. Um, and so, and, and if you, if you twiddle, so what we do in class to it, we try to, to tweak these sentences and see, okay, when is the machine changing the, the, the animal for the verb? And, and students have to, un, have to realize that the machine will, not, will give no indication when, it's, when it has doubts, when it's not sure about the result, right? It will, maybe the, it's 49, 51%, and it will, it will appear as if it was as, as assured of the, of the translation it's giving as another translation that, that the machine is 100% sure. And so, um, students have to learn to be super attentive in an era where all our attention spans are shrinking and depleted. And that's another thing that I think is super important in the classroom. Thank you. Um, Damien, for you, uh, in your context as both an educator and, a, and as a practitioner, how are you using AI right now in both areas of your work? Well, hello to everybody on the other side of the Pacific, and thank you, Laura. It's nice to see Professor Chen again. Um, in my role as an interpreting instructor, I've updated my syllabus for site translation, which is a mandatory course for all first-year students in our program. In the past, more than two-thirds of the course would focus on reformulation techniques, such as segmentation and conversion. Now, I actually emphasize the ability to analyze the source text and, the, and to oralize the machine-translated text. This is because 
my own work experiences have shown that most texts that require site translation are provided to us in soft copies. So where privacy and confidentiality rules allow, interpreters usually can leverage machine translation to facilitate their work. I sometimes use um, large language models such as ChatGPT to help me adapt texts for classroom teaching purposes. It can also help create a preliminary slide deck based on a text I would be using. I would occasionally use automatic speech recognition software such as otter.ai or Yating in Taiwan's context to give me a transcript of the video so that I can check students' interpretation. I also suggest students to transcribe their own English interpretation and then ask, for example, ChatGPT to revise it so that they can improve on grammar, coherence, and idiomatic expressions. That's about the extent of um, AI usage in my classroom. I think the advent of AI doesn't really change the actual techniques of interlingual reformulation. It does put a higher demand on attention switching so interpreters cognitive flexibility is probably going to matter a lot more more importantly though this hype around ai challenges us to rethink the roles we actually play the value we provide we provide and how our work is genuinely perceived by others but that is a totally different topic and most likely a Pandora's box that can only be dealt with in a separate forum where everyone is candid and open minded. Um, as for how I use AI tools, I don't think I differ too much from other colleagues. Um, large language models are very useful for domain knowledge enhancement, especially explaining unfamiliar theories, mechanisms, acronyms, etc. I also use ASR and machine translation when the conditions allow. I find them to be very helpful, partly because they sometimes do a better job than I can, and sometimes because they do the tedious and boring parts of the job for me so that I can reserve my precious human intelligence to the more interesting or critical parts of the job. Most colleagues I know or have interviewed share similar experiences and sentiments. Thank you. Thank you. Before we go on to the individual questions, I just want to remind our audience, I do see that 26 of you have posted questions in the Zoom Q&A. Don't forget, here in the auditorium, if you do have questions, you can raise your hands, and we have students who are going around with cards that they can provide to you so that uh, they can be collected and, and asked in our concluding 15 minutes. Okay, now I'd like to ask some individual questions of our panelists who each have their own niche, and I want to make sure we get at some of your deeper expertise in those niches. And just for an idea, maybe three to five minutes on your answer, if you would. Um, Wallace, I'll start with you. You did your PhD on corpus linguistics, and you just spent your sabbatical focusing on AI and translation and interpretation. How has your research shifted your perspective on the role of AI? You just listed a bunch of tools that can be used in a lot of ways, but I'm imagining on the larger scale that you must have learned some things that have shifted your perspective on the use of AI in translation and interpretation. Yes, uh, it's been a, a very rewarding experience uh, since, uh, since I uh, finished my uh, sabbatical because it gave me some opportunities to review uh, the kind of resources that I had in the past and then try to retool and reorient myself in the uh, research area that I want to focus on. Actually, uh, the development of uh, AI technology, uh, when we talk about it uh, in relation to uh, the kind of corpus technology that I, that I did, it's an a natural extension of corpus linguistics because both applications are uh, text-based and uh, there are a lot of uh, data processing involved. And so when I was doing my uh, PhD back in England uh, uh, in 2002 to 2006, uh, I compiled a, uh, from scratch a 2.4 million uh, word uh, parallel corpus of uh, translation from English into Chinese on uh, scientific, uh, popular science, scientific texts. And uh, in that corpus, 
I collected high quality materials simply because you really need high quality data in order to really get uh, real information and good information from the query that you perform on the database. And uh, I emphasize high quality because uh, in corpus linguistic, we we have this concept of garbage in, garbage out. So uh, you really want to have a high quality translation when you want to perform or develop AI. However, uh, in the early uh, in the late nineteen nineties, when when Google started to uh, launch its uh, machine translation application and uh, encourage translators from around the world to participate in that system and to contribute data into it. Uh, the initial uh, collection of data was not uh, very uh, ideal for uh, processing uh, large language models. So uh, after many years of perfection, right now we have seen some major improvement in the uh, machine translation system that, uh, that we have seen so far. So I think uh, AI would make a really handy and effective tool for us to process, for example, the uh, initial uh, steps of translation. For example, we can come up with a translation uh, draft with AI. However, uh, there are some areas that uh, human translators have an upper hand. So, for example, uh, in terms of tone, in terms of context, in terms of uh, nuances and uh, idiomatic expressions, I think we still rely on human translators or interpreters to handle those uh, high-stake, high-profile uh, assignments. So I think it, it is very important that we use uh, AI wisely. Uh, the famous, the, the well-known uh, futurist, uh, um, Grand, uh, Graham Codrington once said that we actually don't need AI. We really, what we really need is uh, IA, that's uh, intelligent assistant. So uh, I think we need to make good use of AI and try to utilize it so that uh, we are always at the driver's seat and we use AI as an assistant to help us uh, do a better job and so as that uh, we are not replaced by AI or even outweighted by AI. So that's my opinion. Thank you. Yes, in terms of intelligence assistance, I think all of us could use that, but we have gotten very used to Siri or Alexa becoming that intelligence assistant. We want to know the answer to a question. Boom. We can look it up right away. Um, and, you know, it used to be said that interpreters should be walking encyclopedias. And I think we realize our limitations, but if we're not careful, we rely too heavily on the, the tools uh, to replace rather than assist. Carlos. Uh, let's go over to you, please. You have been doing a great deal of work with your students to help them navigate balancing traditional translation skill building with wisely using the many available translation tools. In your view, what kind of training or skills updating is needed for whether you're talking about the beginners or mid-career professionals? Because I have to say I've spoken with many mid-career to late-career professionals who are saying, it's time to hang up my hat. I'm, you know, this old dog can't learn new tricks. Um, but I personally don't think that's true, but what's your advice on what translators and interpreters need to do to stay in the game? So, like Natalia said in the previous panel, for us translators, um, AI and machine translation has been there for a long time, right? But it's true that lately it's become good enough that it's starting to shrink the market, particularly for unskilled translators, right? So, if if you are not capable of doing, of translating better than a machine, it's gonna be very hard for you to find someone willing to, to pay you money to, for, for your work, which is a big, is, is a big change from the, the previous paradigm. So when my generation started translating, we could learn how to translate while being paid. And we probably translated maybe worse than machine translation can translate now. And we had a couple of, we, we could take a couple of years to learn how to translate professionally, right? And so the, the bar for what market ready is has been raised dramatically in the last, in the last couple of years. Um, and now when, whenever a new translator gets into the market, he has, he, she has to hit the, the, 
the ground running, um, has to be ready from, from, for the get, from the get go, right? And so that, to me, so what I would say is, we need, or translators now need a longer training process, um, and that's where an, an MA like ours really can help. Um, you absolutely need to learn the, the technical skills, um, the pitfalls, the general pitfalls, the specific pitfalls of, of AI and machine translation in your language combination, um, the, the dangers of sourcing with, with AI, because AI is very black box, it's very hard to get, to get AI to give you a source of information, and if we don't have a source, we are in the hands of an algorithm, and so that can be dangerous, and, and, and new translators need to, to be able to navigate that. But I want to echo what has already been said, the, the, the skills that will make you valuable in the market are the same skills that made a translator valuable before, are old school skills. Um, analytical skills, critical reading, amazing language, linguistic skills, um, cultural nuance, or like, like Natalia said before, political sensi uh, sensitivity. Winnie said, get comfortable with ambiguity. That, that she was speaking about the, the the market, but also at, at the text, at the, like in a, in a text, when you're working in a text, ambiguity and implicit meaning is what the machine cannot, cannot work with or isn't prepared to work with. And so we have to, we have to, to, to bring the best of ourselves in, into this, into, in, when there's ambiguity, when we need to bring our, our knowledge of the world, of how, how things work, right? Um, I always, I always wondered why machines were doing such a good job with legal texts when they weren't doing as good, as good a job with other texts. And first I thought it was because they had a lot of documents that they could pull terminology from and compare. But what I've realized is that legal texts leave no room for interpretation. Legal texts have everything that you need there and will pur purposely be, be very explicit in everything. And that's why the machine does a very good job there. With any other text and with inter interesting texts, right? where the reader has to provide meaning, where the reader has to bring something to the table, the machine's still a long ways uh, from, what we can, from what we can do, and so. Are you saying legal texts are not interesting? <coughs> That's okay, it, you it, don't have to answer. It, it was implicit, <laughs> now you made it explicit. Implicit, yes, <laughs> human intuition. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, I mean, learning what, a, what the reader from a source text will understand from context, from experience, and if you as a translator need to make that explicit or not, the machine will, will I, I don't want to say will never do that because we've seen the machines improve so much that you can never say never, but it, it, will, it will take a long time for the machine to be able to do that. So, you know, reskill, uh, because there is a huge market Right, as we said before, there has never been as, as much material translated as there is today. Um, the thing is that you need you need a, a higher level than, than you did in previous in previous times, previous generations. Great, thank you. Next, I'd like to turn to Damien. Damien, you're not only a professor and a practitioner, but you're also a vice president of the International Conference Interpreters Association (IEC), which has a true dedication nurturing the craft of high-level, high-quality conference interpretation. Can you please share how the conference interpretation community is adapting to the changing landscape and how this might be different for new students versus mid-career professionals? Okay, this is my 10th year as an IEC member and I'm finally, finally approaching the end of my three-year term as vice president. Um, before assuming this position, I was never really actively in involved. So I held some of the same prejudice of the wider interpreting community against AIC, seeing it as a very conservative group, resistant to changes. I must say that AIC deserves some credits and not just criticism. AIC strives to defend the common rights of its members, but since markets differ, in their political, economic, social, technological, and cultural dynamics, the interpreting profession naturally faces different issues. So finding the biggest common denominator is often a very tricky and challenging endeavor. Um, a few years ago, distance interpreting was the biggest issue. There are still many issues AIC is discussing and debating, such as how RSI impacts our cognitive load and thus our performance, or how compressed sound affects our physical 
and mental health. These critical issues have long-term impacts on the profession because they involve not only interpreters, but also employers, clients, and the audience we serve. That's why we need to navigate cautiously and gather empirical evidence for rigorous scientific research before we jump into conclusions and make hasty decisions. AIC is taking the same approach to AI. I interviewed dozens of colleagues around the world earlier this year, and I found that some members embrace AI tools almost unconditionally, while others say it is a crime for interpreters to be promoting AI tools. But in between these two extremes are a wide array of situations. So one thing AIC is trying to do is to help interpreters become more knowledgeable about AI tools and the pros and cons of using them. For example, how does LLMs actually work? When can we use machine translation? When is automatic speech recognition permissible? It's really not about teaching people how to use a specific tool. It's more about gaining a basic understanding of how these technologies work and the related issues that come with their usage. More importantly, AIC is preparing members to engage with clients and employers constructively. What do we say when they come to us apologetically and say that they're going to try AI interpreting? How do we help them understand the pros and cons of human intelligence versus artificial intelligence? How do we explain from a cost perspective, from a risk perspective, or from a communication perspective? So in addition to organizing events to increase awareness and learn about AI, I would like to encourage more research on the effects of AI on interpreting. For example, does an audience trust machine translated live captioning more than they trust human interpreters? We just heard from Winnie um, and her data. Under what circumstances does a particular type of audience prefer machines over humans or vice versa? We need a lot of empirical research, especially from the user's perspective, before we jump into any conclusion. We must observe carefully and describe objectively before we prescribe authoritatively. This is the normal course of action in fields that have an exploratory nature. So in the meantime, Ike will continue to help the conference interpreting community by offering workshops and sharing information. Thank you. Thank you very much. My last individual question is for Weiwei. As a visiting scholar here at the Institute, you are engaged in research on how AI advance, advancements are changing the translation and interpretation field, with a special focus on interpretation assessment. So with that as your focus, can you tell us what are the potential challenges or limitations in integrating AI into translation and interpretation education and assessment, and how can these obstacles be addressed to maximize the benefits of AI in the learning process? Thank you very much. Um, so I can divide the answer um, into two parts, challenges and solutions. Well, there's a long list of challenges when we talk about AI application in <laughs> the uh, assessment process. Um, well, I just name a few uh, for your reference. First one, how do we monitor the students' different levels and how do we give real-time feedback? This is one of the um, most difficult point for AI to be integrated in the process of interpreting education and also interpreting quality assessment. Um, and the second one will be material selection. Um, we as both um, like um, trainers and students are always uh, wondering how to find the most appropriate material uh, with um, the suitable difficulty level for the students to practice. So how can we use AI to give a professional guidance, maybe to recommend the most appropriate material for the students to practice? And that can be also um, aligned with the content of the real world 
a real world teaching scenario. Um, that's a topic that AI need to address and also a very huge challenge right now. Um, and also self-assessment. Um, even with AI um, as a tool uh, for learning, we still emphasize on the importance of self-assessment or, again, critical thinking um, when students are faced with um, the automatic assessment result. And also about the quality and reliability. Um, that's another challenge. How do we ensure AI tools are reliable and accurate enough uh, that can provide uh, constructive feedback, just like our trainers? Uh, so that is, that is another thing. And some emotional challenges, like people are always resisted to change. So how can we convince our teachers to join us to shape a better AI, a smarter AI? And also, how can we solve the ethical issues, like when we attract um, students to, to feed in more data, how do we uh, protect their privacy, uh, like data privacy? And also, how do we... Um, um, down tune the potential uh, buyers in the AI algorithm. These are all the um, challenges, just to name a few. But still we have the solutions. Um, the solutions include we should take the lead in enhancing the AI algorithm, just as Winnie said. We as um, interpreters and interpreting students, DNI students, should join in the force of developing AI algorithm. And second thing is we should um, try to think about uh, how to give constructive feedback in a um, systematic way or to create a mechanism uh, for constructive feedback. Actually, I learned a lot at MIS um, from our professors here by auditing or observing their courses. A lot of um, TNI teachers here, professors here, have a very um, robust and uh, rigorous uh, rubrics for feedbacks, and that can be integrated in the uh, AI system. And also we need continuous fee user feedbacks, so when we give our student and teachers the algorithm to use, we should also con co collect the testing result and to get the feedbacks so that we can you know, adjust the AI tools into our educational settings to improve effectiveness. So in a world, um, I wanted to say for those of us who wear the hats of uh, trainers, researchers, interpreters, or translators, we should be the one to join in the force of development of AI, rather than being the one who get the, note, the final notice. So um, there's a saying, the time to act is now. So if not us, then who? If not now, then when? Thank you. It feels like it's always now. <laughs> it's always us, but it is, it's true. This is, it's important that we as educators and practitioners and students of translation interpretation really need to be the one to engage. Client education is a big theme that I'm hearing quite a bit, you know, in ensuring that clients know, we ourselves first know, and then our clients understand under what circumstances do we find that the tools help us more? Under what circumstances do we need to go back to basics? So um, for our last round here of questions that I have for you, and if we have time, perhaps you'll be able to ask some questions of each other within this group before we go back to the 15-minute the Q&A session for everybody. Um, the question I'd like to do in a rapid round is, what do each of you have to say to up and coming TNI professionals. What are your words of wisdom? Wei Wei, we'll go backwards starting with you from the direction we were just in, please. Thank you very much. The first one is embrace AI. Um, I hope that we can all harness um, the power of AI to enhance our efficiency, but also we can keep improving our essential skills like uh, bilingual competence, culture sensitivities, and the real-time decision-making power. And the second thing is we need to stay curious, and we should continue to learn and adapt to blend the best of technology with the art of language to thrive in this era of ever-involving TNI technology. And my last word is see you in the future. 
Damien, would you also like to address this? What do you have to say to up and coming TNI professionals about what they should focus on and what advice you would have for them? I have three comments. First, settings that require interaction, especially genuine exchanges of ideas, will need human interpreters. Therefore, interpersonal skills would be critical and consecutive interpreting done by human interpreters will be more valued by clients. Secondly, stay engaged. Don't simply embrace the technologies without pausing to question their effects, not only on your income, but also on language, on identity, on politics, on culture, whether positive or negative, long-term or short-term, because we will be on the receiving end of AI's impact on these larger domains. Thirdly, the real issue is not AI interpreting. Instead, the crux of the issue is what kind of value human language professionals provide. If we really enter era machina, how does your human intelligence differ from that of artificial intelligence or from other human interpreters? Most communicative settings, let's be frank, be they international conferences, business negotiations, or medical appointments, do not revolve around the interpreter. The main actors in those settings will always be thinking of ways to get rid of any intermediary that increases cost creates obstacles and lowers efficiency. So think long and hard about what kind of value you provide. But in order to figure out the value you provide, you must first know who you are. I always tell my students that learning such a difficult skill as interpreting forces us to reckon with our inner selves and our true identity. What does your sense of achievement come from? What, does your real, uh, what is your real source of frustration? How do you deal with flattery and humiliation? When do you have peace of mind? Why are you willing to cooperate with some people while you always want to beat the hell out of some others? Please remember that you are first a person, a living human being before you are a translator or interpreter. Know thyself better so that when AI does, take over the microphone, if ever, you will not think it's the end of the world. When I asked for words of wisdom, you really took that seriously. Thank you. <laughs> really great. Um, Wallace, please, what about for you? What, do you? what are your words of wisdom that you'd like to impart? Thank you. Uh, for the uh, next generation of TNI professionals, I think I have three uh, advices to give. Uh, the first one is that uh, language is an in ingenious uh, creation by humans, and it took the modern humans, the Homo sapiens, uh, 200,000 years to evolve and develop the capacity for language. So uh, we must respect it, we must try to protect it, we must try to optimize it uh, with AI. And my second advice is that uh, AI is a uh, highly addictive technology, like TikTok or uh, binge watching. So we need to keep an open mind and question its uh, validity whenever we can, not just relying on AI as our only source of answers and tricks. And my third advice would be that uh, the TNI profession has been around for, uh, I think, over 3,000 years. So what's the trick for its longevity? I think uh, I have a couple uh, trendy words that we need to keep in mind. So the answers are uh, ingenuity, critical thinking, adaptability, empathy, ethics, curiosity, and last but not least, uh, resilience. Thank you. Thank you very much. Carlos, what are your words of wisdom you'd like to impart? I don't know if there's anything left to say. Uh, so we hear a lot of people being scared about, about AI and then being told don't be scared. I think that being scared about the technology that is, that is so amazing as AI is right now is completely legitimate. I think one of the, so you're saying that it's addictive like TikTok. I don't know if it's exactly like TikTok. It is, it is addictive. And one of the things I, I would like to say is 
try to enjoy it. I, 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 find, I find it's very enjoyable to see how machines are evolving and are capable of doing things. And from one year to the next, when I, I teach a class, I will go and, and, and say, machine cannot do this, and suddenly in a year, it's learned to do that. And it's it's scary, but it's also it's it's also very it's also very powerful. And and so, you know, if you are starting, if you are starting a translator, get the best education you can. If you are a translator who's struggling, try to reskill. We've had amazing uh, professionals who came here mid-career and and left me reinvigorated with a renewed skill set. And it's I would say it's never too late. Um, and yeah, I mean. I think it's a, it's it's a great time to be a translator right now, because you know it, it helps you with all the banal decisions and you can concentrate in the important ones, and you know enjoy it. Great, if possible. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I'd like to move us into our next phase, which is a Q and A session that involves not only the panelists that we just heard from, but first let's thank these panelists. But if Winnie can join us back on stage again, and um, if our online panelists can all rejoin us. Yeah, we have a chair right there. And wait, wait, can I steal your seat so I'm able to see the screen? That would be great. Thank you. Please have a seat. <laughs> all right, so. We have questions that have been coming in and were handed to me. Um, thank you for all of these questions. We'll try to get to as many of them as we can. Uh, but it's gonna be hard in 15 minutes to get through as many as would be nice to get through. Um, Weiwei, our first question is for you. All right. Given the rapid development of AI, do you think that mediocre, in quotes, t &I professionals should stay in this profession? No. <laughs> Testing. The simple answer is no. Well, I think with the advancement of AI, um, now we are going through a screening process. Um, the best of the best will be left, and the mediocre or not so good professionals or practitioners will be eliminated. And that's the hard truth. So what we need to do is we need to you know, harness the skills at the same time to enhance our very solid foundation of those very basic skills like bil bilingual competence and then cultural sensitiveness and then how to do effective cross-culture communication. And that's, that's the key. So how, I hope I've answered the question. Yeah, there was a follow-up, but I think you already pretty much answered it. It's how can the average Chinese universities deal with the impact of AI, especially in, in light of students' reluctance to pursue studies in the translation department. So I think, you know, at the same time as we're saying, or you're saying, um, that a mediocre translator or interpreter doesn't have as much of a chance, and this harkens back to what Carlos said, you know, you could start out on the job market before and get paid to learn a bit, and that's no longer quite as true. Mm -hmm. So how can we cope with it in some of the universities? Actually, Carlos, if you want to address that. Yeah, I mean, I don't think that we need to think about this, like, like mediocre is not something definitive. Unskilled is not something definitive. You can be unskilled and then get the skills that you need. It's not, it's not a permanent state of being. Yeah. And so I wouldn't say, you need to leave the market. I, I would say you need to do something to, to stay relevant and to be able to bring something to the table, to be able to, to, to harness AI instead of being trampled by AI. Yeah. Did you want to add? Yeah, so just one real quick point. As Winnie has said, uh, don't obsess with the job title. Actually, for the so-called mediocre students, there are a lot of other choices for you to do in the language industry. So rather than just being a simultaneous conference interpreter, you have a lot of other work to do, like a AI trainer, like editors, um, like um, um, uh, dubbing, like multi-language dubbing. Um, so you, you can try to find out the, the value that you can give rather than just focusing on too much on the top of the cream. Mm. Do any of our other panelists want to add to this idea of 
um, mediocrity is no longer really a possibility, right? Um, I, I have to say, when I started out as an interpreter, I was at the low end of mediocre, for sure. And I was very lucky that I, I found a way to work on my skills while on the job. But I think it's partially because I took jobs that involved translation and interpretation as part of the job. I was a legal assistant in a law firm. And as such, I built my understanding of an area of expertise that I had not studied when I got my TNI degree. And on that job, I learned a lot about a new field at the same time as I continued to build my skill. And in that way, my mediocrity allowed for me to blossom in a different role. Anybody else have anything to add on the mediocrity question? I'm, like, I'm liking this word. Please. I think uh, there are many, many niche markets for uh, interpreters and translators at different level to try. Because uh, when I first started uh, with my career, I didn't know what I could do. I tried everything. I tried all types of interpreting and translation services before I realized what I could do and what I could not do. So um, there, there might be opportunities where you will, you will find and you will see that you, you will not be able to do anything related to physics or chemistry, so don't touch those markets. And uh, again, uh, different markets require different professionals. There are mediocre doctors, there are mediocre singers, there are mediocre dancers. So we, we do not expect everybody to be perfect. Of course. <laughs> so we try to aim high, but uh, there's just uh, so much that you could do in your lifetime. So try to do your best and never give up. Okay, so as someone who has worked for more than 30 years and as a career advisor, my perspective is this. A career is a long time. It's not a stationary kind of a state. And so let's talk about the idea of a professional identity. Okay, um, a lot of students start out by saying, I want to be this, right? If I don't do that, I have failed. I would encourage you, I wanna go back to Damien's point about know thyself, right? Um, always take the approach of looking at your environment and the technology changes is one area. Think about what it is doing for you and what, is, what it is doing to you, right? Try to maximize, reflect, and maximize what it can do for you and try to minimize what it is doing to you I think you'll do fine. <laughs> okay, thank you. Our next question is for Yu Yang. And the question is, what are the considerations for having both human interpreters and machine translation for the same event? Is there a data point to show which model is preferred by the audience? And when you referred to 90 to 95% accuracy, how is that number calculated? Well, well just now I mentioned that the, the event uh, both have the human translation and the machine translation. It actually, first of all, is a new uh, option for the old audience, and then it kind of the new experience for the audience to experience the new technologies use uh, the uh, machine translation. And uh, secondly, it, uh, I think it's a double guarantee. It's a guarantee for both for the human translators and uh, and also the human translators to uh, interpreters to guarantee the accuracy of the machine translation. But this kind of the situation happens more and more in, here in Chinese market. And uh, also with, with regard to the quality of the machine translation, um, I would say that how good is the machine translation depends on the training data. Just imagine, so with the past of 50 years, we actually uh, uh, the machine translation I mentioned is not the Google Translate. Uh, actually, the machine translation we trained is that we put the past 50 years uh, documented translation, human translation, uh, to train the ma machines. And uh, also, the annually, we, we feed about uh, 5 million words, human translation data, so to train the machines. 
and also for the conference interpreting. Each year, we have 10,000 hours conference interpreting data to train the uh, simultaneous interpreting machine translation. So just imagine that data, high quality data, is human translator's result. And uh, just now I mentioned, never use a human's uh, imagination to assess the computer's capabilities. That means actually the, the, the machine translation we trained is very high qualities. But uh, so that we actually have the huge amount of the data and we welcome the corporations from the universities. We want to provide all these data, the, 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 uh, the human translation of the data and also the conference interpreting data to help us, to help us uh, the interpreters to have the uh, uh, quality assessment. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so this points to uh, what was being discussed earlier, the necessity of doing a lot of research to have the data to back up our hypotheses that we hold. Um, Carlos, interesting question for you here. One of the common negative pieces of feedback that we often get from clients is that this looks like a machine translation. So the question is, do you think that the stigma of machine translation will go away? In, in what sense will go away? Well, I know for myself, for instance, I was as I was reading this question, I was thinking I used to be annoyed if I would find, I would get some information in a language that I don't speak, I would plug it into Google Translate or DeepL or whatever, and I'd be annoyed if I found something that sounded non-native in the English translation to me. Now I don't even notice it. I just, I'm just going for information so that I don't care about. If we're gonna get used to language being used by machines, doing things that machines do that we don't do, I don't know. <laughs> I don't see the future, but I can I can see it as a possibility that we will get used to this kind of texts. I think that they will be like we will still want to hear a human voice for enjoyment, for literature, for anything that has to do with persuasive texts. But there will be probably a higher a higher threshold of to of tolerance for for texts that are written by non-human entities that that say things. In a, in a way that we wouldn't say, and we'll get more used, and they'll be yeah. I, I can see that, that happening for sure. I mean, I, I think it depends on it, it. will depend on on the context. Like for what I do, uh, when I translate for literature, I think that the stigma will be long lasting. But for other kinds of texts, yeah, why not? Thank you, Natalia. We have a question for you. It's a quick one. What machine translation engine do you use at the UN? But actually, maybe if I could expand the question just a little bit, do you know what the process is for making the determination about what tools to use at the UN? Yes, we use a, a mix of engines that uh, vary by language combinations, and we select them through blind testing in the context of procurement exercises. So it's, um, it, it's part of a, a, a protocol for engine selections that we have where we measure different, different parameters before we select uh, different engines as well. Thank you. Um, Wallace, a question for you. Do you have any advice for prospective students wanting to become conference interpreters and still on their way going through the application process? I think uh, you... My advice would be that uh, keep your uh, curiosity, remain curious about everything, and try to uh, keep up with the current you know, news and what's happening around the world. Uh, be, be curious uh, for uh, any new terms or uh, new things that you have heard or have read on the papers because uh, when you go out there to translate or interpret, you don't know what kind of assignments would, would land on you. So it's like a uh, you know, walking encyclopedia. You, you need to be able to handle tough situations, tough areas or unknown areas that you have no idea about. So uh, be prepared to uh, absorb a lot of knowledge and try to handle uh, difficult 
uh, language situations with the best of your ability because it takes creativity and lots of other things. Thank you. There's a question for me, which is, um, will MIST be offering AI translation workshops for mid-career professionals? And we do not currently have plans for that, but we are finding that there are so many people who are now feeling the need to reskill that we're looking at different ways to offer reskilling options. So we have currently, for instance, some asynchronous online short courses that we're offering. Um, I, I developed one that's in note taking for consecutive interpretation. Max Troyer of our translation and localization management uh, department developed one that's on subtitling for Netflix and other purveyors of subtitles. And these are ways that you can kind of dip in. And I do think AI is probably the next frontier, but it feels a bit big <laughs> as a thing to do as an upskilling workshop. So it is something that we will continue to look at. And I think that the translation and interpretation community in general, there have been all kinds of new online upskilling forums that have been growing. And I find a lot of working professionals finding their way towards these various platforms to upskill in, in interesting ways. And AI is definitely the next frontier for that. We're almost out of time for all of our panelists. Is there anything else you would like to say? I know in our second panel we said any last words of wisdom and we didn't quite make it around in the first panel. If anybody has anything to add, now's your moment. All right, well thank you very much to our at least 267 online folks who are, who are currently there on Zoom and everybody who is with us on the live stream in China and everybody who's here in the auditorium who I hope will help us finish the food that's out in the lobby. Um, thank you a million times to our panelists. Before we end, we would like to end our interpretation now and ask our interpreters to sprint down the stairs and come to the stage because we would like to see you on the stage and thank you. And I would also very much like to thank Grace Shen Xiaoyan, and please come to the stage. She was the amazing force behind this. And I would also like to thank Sierra Abukins, our communications director, who has made incredible contributions, as well as Chelsea Riddle, who is our media services whiz, who has done so much to make this possible. So please come forward, everybody who I just said, and I would like for you to sprint so that we're not making folks wait. <laughs> I don't see sprinting, <laughs> but Grace, please. Thank you. And I hear that our live stream has 8,000 people online. So thank you to all of you who tuned in online. Um, we're very pleased. Chelsea, please join us. Interpreters, come. Unfortunately, interpreters rarely get recognized, but we at this school feel very strongly that they need to be recognized for the incredible hard work that they do. So thank you very much to our interpreters. Please come to the middle, join us. Go ahead and line up against the middle of the room. Interpreters, take a bow. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a pleasant day if you're tuning in from Asia, and have a wonderful evening if you're tuning in from here. Take care.